make an introduction to the question of sexual behavior, a subject which has attracted a great deal of attention from anthropologists, largely because it perhaps surprised them how flexible the rules about sex were in different societies. The first problem is what, in fact, is sex? One could take a very strict definition and limit it to coitus, an act of sexual intercourse between one human being and some other object. This would be broad enough to include masturbation, bestiality, and other forms. But in these post-Freudian and, and post-Malinovskian days, it seems an unduly restricted definition. There are many forms of behavior and thought which come within the province of sexual behavior, but which have little to do with actual sexual intercourse. As a result, as Malinovsky put it, sex is rather a sociological and cultural force than a mere bodily relation of two individuals. And more extremely, as Robin Fox put it, sex is in the head. It's a cultural force, and it can be altered and thought about in all sorts of different ways. Thus, like marriage, it's difficult to define. Furthermore, it can easily be, be argued that it is not a universal drive. Biologically, we may be conditioned to procreate. But despite the jokes, um, there are instances of societies which have minimized sexual behavior and sexual thought to such an extent that it seems almost possible to do without sex. We tend, perhaps nowadays, to think too strongly that sex is something that is bound to pop up like a cork somewhere, and if it doesn't come up in a straight form, it comes up in some disguised form in terms of symbolism. Let's look at a broad overview of the typology of sexual behavior. And one can conceive of it in a form of concentric rings, which, taking the individual at the center, an ego, who could be a woman or a, a man, married or unmarried, if one works outwards, one has a series of categories of sexual behavior. Many of these are blanket terms which need to be differentiated for example, male homosexuality from lesbianism. Each of these different kinds of behavior, as illustrated in the concentric diagrams, concerns the moving of an individual across a boundary. Sometimes a person is crossing several boundaries at the same time. And it's not always possible in advance to tell which kind of boundary a society will consider is being crossed. For example, Edmund Leach points out that sexual intercourse with a brother's wife in some societies is treated as adultery. It's the adulterous relationship that is being stressed, while in others it is incest. It's a relative. Also, the activities in this diagram have been placed in a pattern which suggests that their degree of abhorrence is similar to our own. This, in fact, is not always the case, as we'll see, that some acts which we consider particularly revolting and awful in other societies are tolerated or even, in certain circumstances, encouraged. Let us start from the center of the rings in the question of sex with oneself, or, as it's known, masturbation. This is, covers both male and female self-sex. The attitude towards this particular offense is usually very severe. Indeed, it's a subject which perhaps you will have noticed is not, is one of the few subjects which are still largely taboo in the public media, and it's not a word that's used on television or in newspapers much. This is an attitude which has been present for quite a long period in Christian Western civilizations. In the middle classes particularly, it was considered to be possibly that very sin against the Holy Ghost, which was never mentionable in the Bible because of its awful nature. It was individualistic, it was secret, it was dirty, it was dangerous, it led to all sorts of diseases, to early death, pimples, your hair falling out, and so on. It was, in fact, the nearest equivalent, perhaps, in Western societies to those incest taboos and avoidances which we'll discuss later. In fact, it has been suggested that it was one of the major sources of the guilt complexes of Western civilizations. If you remember, 
we saw that there was a long period between sexual maturity at 14 or 15 for both sexes and marriage, perhaps 10, 12, 15 years. When you couldn't marry, you couldn't have sex. And those who practiced masturbation during that period were told that this was an evil, dirty, and dangerous activity. Other societies have not considered it, on the whole, to be such an awful offense. Partly, of course, they haven't had this large gap. Secondly, they've often, as we'll see, allowed premarital sexual intercourse. And so, s masturbation perhaps hasn't been such a widespread institution, nor has it been considered so awful. For example, the Eek people, um, a starving people in Africa, described by Colin Turnbull, consider it more pleasant than ordinary sex because it involves less effort, less strain, less setting up of social relationships with other people. In some societies, it's something which everyone goes through and it's not individualistic and secret. In, among certain tribes in Sikkim, for example, it's suggested that young people indulge in communal masturbation. And later on in their lives, they'll talk about this frankly and freely in the society I worked in in Nepal. Also, it wasn't a subject which was taboo in conversation, and you might reminisce about the old days and communal living, and this might be one aspect of it. In Western societies, the interesting feature is that while it's a taboo subject, and most people believe that they are among the very few who practice this, studies, particularly the famous studies by Kinsey and others, suggest that the rates of masturbation are very high indeed. In Kinsey's study, in among men in the United States, uh, he discovered that among white uh, males, something like 92% of males masturbated to orgasm, and the rates were slightly related to educational intelligence. 96% of those at college level did so. So it's almost universal to do so, and the rates for Western Europe are of the same order. The two-thirds of boys self-masturbation provided the first ejaculation. And the rates are very high, something like two and a half times a week in early adolescence. This is not something that's confined to men, of course. And the rates among women are also very high, as discovered by Kinsey. Something between a half and three quarter of US women had some experience of masturbation. And it's almost universal among those who are widowed young, widows aged over 40 years, almost universally masturbate. The figures um, for the past, of course, are more difficult to establish, but Pusey, who did some research among young boys in 19th century England, suggested that only about 10% were free from this vice, as it was termed then. In the non-Western societies, the figures are more difficult uh, to establish, and it's probable that the rates are lower, but that when they, it does occur, there's little strong sanctions against it. Turning to the next, which is relation, sexual relations with not oneself, but with animals, or bestiality as it's termed, with a non-human creature, you find exactly the same interesting phenomenon. That is a widespread taboo against even discussing the subject. Uh, it's harshly regarded until recently, and possibly still, people were imprisoned if they were discovered um, practicing this offence, and yet quite high statistics. Um, the attitudes can be seen in certain United States, um, parts of the United States, it's still illegal and there's heavy punishment. In the 17th century, England, it was a felony punishable by death, and interestingly and curiously, the offending animal uh, was also executed, hanged at the same time, and we'll go into the reason for that in a minute. But in many societies, although um, it's not widely practiced, it's in fact one of the ways in which you mark a special occasion. Anthropologists have noticed that in ritual you often invert normal behavior and do something the opposite of that. And in his famous book on the rites of passage, Van Genep noticed that you have a form of sexual inversion using animals in sex, which marks a particular occasion, a, a, a rite of passage from one social status to another. Thus he writes, intercourse with an animal 
may in particular cases be a right of incorporation. In Madagascar, a man may, can have sexual relations with a woman only after having had intercourse with a heifer, which had been specially cared for and which is adorned with flowers and garlands. In Dalmatia, to be freed of consumption, a man should have intercourse with a hen or a duck, to get rid of gonorrhea with a hen, cutting her throat during the act, to learn the language of the animals with a female snake. Some of us may be slightly puzzled at how this could take place, and of course I ought to stress that such customs are not perhaps as widespread as they were. But generally the point to be illustrated is that sexual relations with animals are treated in all sorts of different ways in different societies. In Western societies, which is the only area where there have been statistical surveys, Kinsey again found the incidence quite high. Among US white males, among farm-raised boys, who obviously need access to animals, about 17% had experienced orgasm as a byproduct of animal contacts, nearly one in five. And if you included pre-adolescent experience and contacts of a strong physical type not leading to orgasm, probably at least half farm-raised children, uh, males, had had such contacts. Of course, this is confining sex to that bo bodily and physical relationship which I talked about, and if you define sex in its much wider sense of a close, emotional, semi-sensuous relationship with something, then you have much higher figures than this. If you have a talk about strong physical emotions of tenderness, affection of a both a physical and an emotional kind with between men and animals, then you probably have um, bestiality in the widest sense, though the word of course has all sorts of unpleasant associations, in a wide range of settings in Western societies. For example, many pet owners in Western societies have a very close and intimate relationship with their animals. It's a subject which is so touchy and difficult to talk about, in fact, that those who've done research on the subject have always tended to have to avoid investigating the sexual relations between, uh, between um, animal owners and their pets, but it's probably quite widespread. The horror which does often occur in this uh, area is interpreted by anthropologists uh, as an example of how when you try and cross a boundary between different categories, between humans and animals, particularly in this very deep relationship a sexual relationship which is, establishes uh, an equality between the partners, then this raises all sorts of taboos. You get all the myths about monstrous births that are created by such um, relationships. Because what happens when you have sexual relations with an animal is that you turn that animal in a way into a human being. You put it on a par with yourself. And this, of course, may help to explain why in the past, in our own society, animals had to be hanged. They had become, by that act of sexual intercourse, humans, even if not fully consenting in the relationship. And this could not be allowed. Probably this was the reason, rather than the fear that they might give birth to some monstrous birth. The next kind of relationship, which is often forbidden, is the relationship not between a man and an animal, but between a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, homosexual relationships. Again, it's impossible to confine oneself to physical relationships. Here one is talking about deep affection and physical attraction without intercourse. And this is almost universal in human beings. The general term is homosexuality, um, which is an unspecific term meaning sexual relations between persons of the same sex. But one needs to distinguish between male homosexuality and, as it's known after lesbos, lesbianism which is female to female. One form of male homosexuality where there are actual sexual relations is known after Sodom and Gomorrah as sodomy. Now the attitude towards this offence varies greatly from time to time and from class to class and there seem to be cyclical patterns over time. For example in the court of James I in the beginning of the 17th century there was a tolerant attitude towards homosexuality then there has been a very austere period in the 
18th and particularly the 19th centuries, and the attitude, of course, in the middle of the 19th, uh, 20th century became more relaxed. Many other societies have for a long time, time taken a much more relaxed attitude towards um, such affairs between people of the same sex. For example, Chagnon, describing the Yanomama Indian, said, some of the teenage males have homosexual affairs and people take very little notice of this. In such societies, the demonstration of physical affection between people of the same sex is often not tabooed. I remember my first shock of arriving in Nepal and seeing young boys walking along hand in hand through the streets of Kathmandu and suddenly realizing that in our own society we tend to inhibit demonstrations of affection. But moving to the more obviously sexual aspects, again one finds that while generally frowned on in our society, the rates and incidents are very high. Among males in America, Kinsey found that something like 37% of post-pubertal males have had one homosexual contact leading to orgasm. That's, near, that's nearly four in 10. And something like 4% of adult white males are exclusively homosexual. Is that the end? Females are, up to 20% of females are, uh, who are unmarried have physical relations with other females. 50% have had intense emotional relationships, and 90%, nearly all of them, have had crushes. Thus, there again is a conflict between what the society tells everyone happens and should happen, and what most people actually feel deep down inside them. And it's out of that conflict and the guilt that it induces that a, a great deal of the energy, possibly, of Western societies, as some have suggested, have arisen Nowadays, of course, the two are coming more into line. In the next talk, I want to look at the other aspects of sexual behavior, particularly incest and adulterous relationships.